Hey guys, this is Devo. This is the AWS Solutions Architect Associate Certification Challenge. In this challenge, we're gonna get access to an account already provisioned by Cloud Academy. We're gonna get some instructions on what to do, and the goal is to finish all the steps successfully. Uh, so let's go ahead and open up the console on a new window. And we've got the credentials right here. So let's go ahead and log in. Username is student and we're going to paste the password and we're in so the first thing we want to do is make sure we are in the proper region for this particular lab it's going to be us west 2 which is oregon which we are in uh, and then the next step is just to go to the validation steps so let's begin uh, the first task is a storage question and the question is as follows your manager has tasked you with delivering a database solution that must meet the following criteria. It must offer single digit millisecond latency and it must be managed by AWS. Okay, so your task is to deliver a basic example of a database that will meet this requirement. So what, what it's telling us is we need to create a new database and it's given us a hint right here, Animal Dynamo, uh, Amazon DynamoDB. So I can only assume that it wants us to create a DynamoDB table. So let's go ahead to DynamoDB. Uh, you only need to create a single example of that. Uh, no naming conventions are enforced and no special configuration is needed. So let's just create any new table with no settings and we're just going to let that run so let's go to the second step your company currently uses a single rds instance for scheduling purposes you've been asked to move that maintenance window to sundays the specific window doesn't matter as long as the day is set to sunday so we don't care about the time we just care about the day and additionally we don't need to update the cluster, only the instance. So they're telling us to go to RDS and change the schedule of the maintenance from whatever it is to Sunday. However, um, we see that the database is not ready yet. Uh, so I'm gonna pause the video here for a second. Okay, uh, the database is back online. So before I can click on modify, I have to reselect it and we'll go ahead and change the maintenance window. So we have two dates here. This is the maintenance window for the instance and this is database uh, maintenance window for the cluster. Let's go ahead and change this first one to Sunday, which is what the question is. Apply right now. And this kind of change doesn't require any uh, waiting. It happens instantly. So at this point, let's take a look at our DynamoDB table, make sure that it's created it up and running. So at this point, I think we're ready to uh, request a check, which will evaluate our changes and it will make sure that we've successfully completed the required steps. Okay, looks like we're good. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, this next challenge is a networking challenge and we have three questions. So let's look at the first one. Your company has created a simple web application in, in, in AWS consisting of a load balancer, an EC2 instance, and an RDS database. The EC2 instance needs to be able to access the database to store and retrieve data, but the EC2 instance is displaying a timeout error when attempted to connect to the RDS instance. Find out why and fix the issue. When fixing the issue, ensure that the database stays reasonably restricted. All right. Uh, so in this case, we have an EC2 instance that's not able to access this database. So let's open up the EC2 console as well. And they're talking about a web application. Uh, we have a web server here, which uh, is on Sumnet this with a 10201.0. And the database is part of the same VPC, I believe. Uh, yeah, so the database is part of the same VPC, so there's no reason they shouldn't talk to each other unless the security group is broken somehow. So let's take a look at the security group of the database. 
uh, inbound rules and there is no inbound rules. So let's go ahead and grab the security group ID of the web server. And let's change the database security group to make sure that we're able to access the database. Uh, this is a Aurora MySQL instance. So we need to allow port 3306, which is the default port for MySQL. Let's save that. And we should be uh, good on this first question. Your company hosts a server named API server that serves an API to third party companies. These companies use the public IP address of the API server to connect to it and make API requests. However, whenever the API server restarts, its public IP address changes and third party companies are forced to update their configuration to point to the new IP. Your task is to make whatever changes necessary so that the API server's public IP no longer changes when it restarts. So we have an API server. So let's go to EC2. Sure, indeed we have an API server and the IP address changes automatically every time it restarts. That's standard behavior. So what we need to do, we need to create a brand new Elastic IP and attach the Elastic IP to the instance. So we're looking for the API server. There's only one IP associated with that instance. So we're gonna go ahead and do the mapping there. I'm gonna click associate. So that should take care of the second requirement. So the third question is as follows. Your API server is inside an AWS VPC named API VPC. So I guess we assume there's a second VPC here. Uh, there is another server named Peer Server, which is hosted in a VPC named Peer VPC. These two VPCs are connected using AWS VPC peering. These two servers need to be able to communicate with each other over private DNS using all ports. However, when one of your coworkers attempts to communicate with the Peer Server from within the API server, he is receiving timeout errors. Find out why and fix the issue. Ensure that any other server that may be launched inside the same subnet as the API server have the same level of access as the API server. All right, so this is a question that spans a couple of VPCs. So there's VPC peering involved, which means we have to, uh, I prefer to document things in this kind of questions uh, because it can get confusing when you have multiple subnets, routing tables, network access lists, and so on. So I'm going to start documenting some of the things. So let's start with uh, API VPC. And for API VPC, we're going to we're going to um, gather VPC ID and VPC CIDR. And we'll do the same thing for the peer VPC. VPC ID and VPC CIDR. So let's head over to the VPC module. So peer VPC, I'm going to copy this peer VPC cider. ID. Let's do column right there. And then the same thing for the API VPC, we're going to copy the VPC ID, as well as the CIDR. So this is a pretty standard slash 16, very easy to work with. Uh, I'm assuming that the subnets are gonna be slash 24, which is normally the case. Uh, but let's, let's keep on uh, gathering information. So now we have the information for the uh, API VPC as well as the peer VPC. Now we're talking about API server and peer server. So let's go ahead and collect information for those as well. I'm going to go to instances and I'm going to create a new section here for API server. And what I want to collect about API server is subnet. First of all, we want to know what subnet it belongs to. We want to know what security group is attached to that instance or to that network interface on that instance. And finally, we want to get the IP address. So API server, let's grab that subnet. 
Let's grab the IP address. And let's go ahead and attach or gather the security group ID associated with that instance. It'll make it easier, a lot easier later down the road to, to verify our configuration changes. And finally, let's gather the information for the peer server. So the same kind of uh, data that we gathered for API. So this is peer server. We want to gather the subnet. We want to gather the secure group ID as well as the IP address. So for the IP address, we already copied that. Uh, let's go ahead and copy uh, the subnet and the security group. Okay, let's get back to the question. Vista VPCs are connected using AWS VPC peering. So on this kind of questions, um, I tend not to trust statements like this because they, sometimes they throw you off. So let's go ahead and verify the connection there, the peering connection between the two VPCs. Uh, and sure enough, we're talking about API VPC, peer VPC. Um, these appear to be the right subnets. So 201 and 202 and the status is active so uh so that's true and these two servers need to be able to communicate with each other over private dns and using all ports so the private dns right there is a setting within the peering connection if we click on the dns tab uh sure enough they're disabled so the question requires us to enable this so let's go ahead and check those boxes and they need to be able to communicate with each other using all ports. So to me, that tells me I need to enable TCP and UDP. So I'm just going to go ahead and enable all traffic from within uh, both instances. So, uh, so what we need to do here is we need to look at the security group, make sure that we're allowing access from this host. And we check this security group and we make sure we allow access from this host. Um, I'm going to go ahead and allow the subnet instead of just the host. I think uh, somewhere down the question, it also tells us that any other server needs to have that same access. So let's go ahead and uh, apply it at a subnet level. So let's go to secure groups and let's look at the first one here. The secure group is attached to API server. Uh, it's this one. Uh, okay, and this security group is allowing access from the load balancer on port 80, but it does not allow access from our peer server. So I'm going to go ahead and add an inbound rule to this, and I'm going to say allow all traffic because it says all ports. I'm going to allow slash 24. I'm not going to bother with the description. So we've made that change there. And now we need to go to the other security group, which is this one. And we need to make sure that this host can access it. Now, uh, it's already allowing the VPC. Uh, so it already covers the sum that this guy belongs to. So I'm not going to I'm not going to change this. That should be fine. Uh let's go ahead and continue with the with the question. When uh we looks like we should be good there. Uh and there's one thing we haven't checked just yet. Uh which is the network access list, which is something that seems like it could play a role in this question or it would definitely play a role in this question. Uh, so let's ensure that any other servers that may be launched inside the same subnet have the same level of access. So we need to check for uh, for network access lists that are being applied to our subnets here. So I'm going to go ahead and go over to the v, um, network access lists. I'm going to copy each of the subnets. So I'm going to start with API server. And this is the network access list that's applied to this subnet. So what we need to see here is we need to see access being allowed 
from the 202 subnet. Let's go to inbound rules and there's already a rule to allow everything. And there's a rule to allow everything for inbound and outbound. So it looks like this network access list for this particular subnet is good. Uh, let's take a look at the other um, network access list. And this one, we're allowing every outbound traffic. And inbound traffic, we're denying everything, actually. So we need to go ahead and allow access to this subnet. So I'm going to edit this inbound rule. I'm going to add one with a rule number of 100. Uh, and I'm going to allow all TCP here. Actually, I'm going to allow all traffic here. And we're going to match this subnet which is a zero slash 24 because the question is talking about any server that may be launched inside the subnet, not inside the VPC. So I want to slash 24 in there. Let's go ahead and save this. So now we're allowing access from 201 to everything. So that should satisfy this question as well. Let's go ahead and check. Great. Okay. So let's move on. Let's move over to the final question here. Let's click on next. And here we have a architecture question, which is as follows. Your company uses autoscaling group to determine the number of instances of the web server EC2 to have deployed at any point. Your manager wants you to optimize your company's AWS costs wherever possible. You have investigated and come to the conclusion that your company's autoscaling group only ever deploys up to half of the max instances configured in the autoscaling group. Update the autoscaling group's configuration to reflect an appropriate number of max instances. So what it's telling us is we have an autoscaling configuration that's set to max number of instances to be X, uh, but only half of those ever gets deployed. So it's telling us to adjust our max configuration to match that maximum that we've ever seen. So if I'm reading this correctly, we should be able to go to our scaling groups. I'm going to look at the max, which is four. So it tells us that only two ever get launched. So let's change that to two. Update. I'm not sure how this saves costs because if the instances are not being launched, then you're not paying for them. Um, so that's a little odd. Nonetheless, let's go ahead and check. Okay, looks like we've completed the lab challenge successfully. Let's go ahead and submit the results and we should be good. Okay, great. Uh, that's it for now. I guess I'll see you guys in the next one.